From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi everybody, welcome to this special digital presentation where we're, we're covering the topic of data ops and specifically how IBM is really operationalizing and automating the data pipeline with data ops. And with me is Inderpal Bandari, who is the global chief data officer at IBM. Inderpal, it's always great to see you. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Dave, my pleasure. So you know the, the standard throwaway question from guys like me is, you know, what keeps the chief data officer up at night? Well, I know what's keeping you up at, at night. It's COVID-19. How are I you doing? I think it's keeping, keeping all of us. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how are you guys making out? Uh, as a leader, I'm interested in, you know, how you have responded with whether it's, you know, communications, obviously you're doing much more stuff, you know, remotely. Uh, you're not on airplanes, certainly, like you used to be, but, but what was your first move when you actually realized this was going to require a, a, a shift? Well, I think one of the first things that um, I did was to test the ability of my organization to work remotely. This was well before the, uh, the recommendations came in uh, from the government. Uh, but, but just so that we wanted you know, to, to be sure that this is something that we could pull off if there were extreme circumstances where even everybody would work. And uh, so that was one of the first things we did. Uh, along with that, I think um, another major activity that we embarked on is given that we had created this central data and AI platform for IBM using our hybrid multi-cloud approach, how could that be adapted very, very quickly to help with the COVID uh, situation? So those were the two big items that my team emb embarked on very quickly. And uh, again, like I said, this is well before there was any recommendations from the government or even internally within IBM, we didn't have any uh, recommendations, but we, we decided that we wanted to run ahead and make sure that we were ready to, uh, ready to uh, operate in that. Fashion. And I believe a lot of my colleagues did the same. You know, the yeah, there's a there's a conversation going on right now just around productivity hits that people may be taking because they really weren't prepared. It sounds like you're pretty comfortable with the productivity impact that you're achieving. Oh, I'm totally comfortable with the productivity. In fact, I will tell you that uh, while we've gone down this path, we've realized that in some cases, uh, the productivity is actually going to be better when people are uh, working from home and uh, they're able to uh, focus uh, a lot more uh, on the work aspect. Uh, you know, and this could, this runs the gamut from the nature of the job where, you know, somebody who basically needs to be in the front of a computer and is remotely uh, taking care of operations, uh, you know, if they don't have to come in, th their productivity is going to go up. Somebody like myself who had a long drive into work, uh, you know, which I would use on phone calls, but now um, that that entire time is can be used a lot more productively, a lot more in in a lot more productive manner. So there is, uh, we realize that that there's going to be some aspects of productivity that'll actually be helped by the situation, provided you're able to deliver the services that you deliver with the same level of quality and satisfaction that you've always done. Now there were certain other aspects where you know the productivity is going to be affected. So uh, you know my team, there's a lot of whiteboarding that gets done. There are lots of informal conversations that spark creativity. Uh, those things are much harder to replicate in a remote environment. So we've right. got a sense of uh, you know where we have to do some work to put things together versus where we're actually going to be more productive. But all in all, we are very comfortable that we can pull this off. No, that's great. I, I want to stay on COVID for a moment. And in the context of just data and data ops and, and you know, why now? Obviously with a crisis like this, uh, it, it, it increases the uh, imperative to really have your data act together. But I want to ask you both specifically as it relates to COVID, why data ops is so important? And then just generally, why at this, this point in our time? So, 
I mean, you know the journey we've been on, Dave. You know, when, when I joined, uh, our data strategy centered around uh, uh, cloud data and AI, mainly because IBM's business strategy was around that. And because there wasn't uh, the notion of uh, AI in enterprise, right? There was, uh, everybody understood what AI means for the consumer, but for the enterprise, people didn't really understand uh, what it meant. So our data strategy became one of actually making IBM itself into an AI enterprise, and then using that as a showcase for our clients and customers who look a lot like us to make them into AI enterprise. And in a nutshell, what that translated to was that one had to infuse AI into the workflow of the key business processes of enterprise. So if you think about that, workflow is very demanding, right? You have to be able to deliver data and insights on time, just when it's needed. Otherwise, you can essentially slow down the whole workflow of a major process within an enterprise. But to be able to pull all that off, you need to have your own data ops very, very streamlined so that a lot of it is automated and you're able to deliver those insights as the people who are involved in the workflow need it. So we've spent a lot of time while we were making IBM into an AI enterprise and infusing AI into our key business processes uh, into essentially a data ops pipeline that was very, very streamlined, which then allowed us to very quickly adapt to the COVID-19 situation. And I'll give you one specific example that will go to uh, you know, how one, would, one could essentially leverage uh, that capability that I just talked about to do this. So one of the key business processes that we had taken aim at was our supply chain. You know, we're a global company and our supply chain is critical. We have lots of suppliers and they are all over the globe and we have different types of products so that you know has a multiplicative factors because for each of those you have additional suppliers, and you have events, you have weather events, you have calamities, you have political events. So we have to be able to very quickly understand the risk associated with any of those events with regard to our supply chain and make appropriate adjustments on the fly. So that was one of the key applications that we built on our central data and AI platform. And as part of our data ops pipeline, that meant the ingestion, the ingestion of those several hundred sources of data had to be blazingly fast and also refreshed very, very quickly. Also, we had to then aggregate data from the outside from external sources that had to do with weather-related events, that had to do with political events, social media feeds, et cetera, and overlay that on top of our map of interest with regard to our supply chain sites and also where they were supposed to deliver. We'd also weaved in our capabilities here to track those shipments as they flowed and have that data flow back as well so that we would know exactly where, uh, where things were. This is only possible because we had a streamlined data ops capability and we had built this central data and AI platform for IBM. Now you flip over to the COVID-19 situation. When COVID-19 you know, emerged and we began to realize that this was going to be a significant, significant uh, pandemic, what we were able to do very quickly was to overlay the COVID-19 incidents on top of our sites of interest, as well as pick up what was being reported about those sites of interest and provide that over to our business continuity. So this became an immediate exercise that we embarked. But it wouldn't have been possible if you didn't have the foundation of the data ops pipeline, as well as that central data and AI platform in place uh, to help you do that very, very quickly and adapt to it very quickly. So, so what I really like about this story and something that I want to drill into is that it, it, essentially a lot of organizations have a real tough time operationalizing AI, infusing it, to use your word. Um, and the fact that you're doing it um, 
is really a, a good proof point that I want to explore a little bit. So you're essentially, there was a, a, a number of aspects of what you just described. There was the data quality piece, which your, your data quality, in theory anyway, is going to go up with more data if you can handle it. And the other was speed, time to insight, so you can respond more quickly if it's, think about this COVID situation. If you're days behind or weeks behind, which is not uncommon, you know, sometimes even worse, you just can't respond. I mean, these things change daily, um, sometimes certainly within the day. Um, so is that right? That's kind of the, the business outcome and objective that you guys were after. Yes, you know, so uh, from, a, from an infused AI into your business processes, right? The overarching, um, outcome metric that one focuses on is end-to-end -end cycle time reduction. So you take that process, the end-to-end -end process, and you're trying to reduce the end-to-end -end cycle time by you know, several factors, several orders of magnitude. And I, you know, there are some examples of, um, of things that we did, uh, for instance, in my organization that had to do with the generation of metadata, is data about data. And that's usually a very time consuming process. And we reduced that by over 95% by using AI to actually help in the metadata generation itself. And that's applied now across the board uh, for many different business processes that you know, IBM has. That's the same kind of principle that was used to be able to do that. So that foundation essentially enables you to go after that cycle time reduction right off the bat. So when you get to a situation like a COVID-19 situation, which demands urgent action, your foundation is already geared to deliver on that. So I think actually we might have a graphic and then the second graphic guys, if you bring up this, the second one, I think this is Inderpal, what you're talking about here, that sort of 95% uh, uh, reduction. Uh, guys, if you could bring that up, we'll take a look at it. So, um, this is maybe not a COVID uh, use case. Yeah, here it is. So that 95% reduction in, in cycle time, in, improvement in data quality, what we talked about, there's actually some productivity metrics, right? This is what you're talking about here in this metadata example, correct? Yeah, yes. The metadata, right, it's so central to everything that one does with data. I mean, it's basically data about data. And this is really the business metadata that we're talking about, which is once you have data in your data lake, if you don't have business metadata describing what that data is, then it's very hard for people who are trying to do things to determine whether they can even whether they even have access to the right data or not. And typically this process has been done manually because somebody looks at the data, they looks at the fields, then they describe it, and it could easily take months. And what we did was we essentially used a deep learning and a natural language processing approach looked at all the data that we've had historically over at IBM, and we've automated the metadata generation. So whether it was, you know, you were talking about the data relevant for COVID-19 or for our supply chain or for our accounts receivable process, any one of our business processes, this is one of those fundamental steps that one must go through to be able to get your data ready for action. And if you're able to take that cycle time for that step and reduce it by 95%, you can imagine the acceleration of that. Yeah, and I liked what you were saying before, you talked about the end-to-end -end, uh, concept. You're, you're applying system thinking here, which is very, very important because you know, a, lot of, a lot of clients that I talk to, they'll, they're so focused on one metric, maybe optimizing one component of that end-to-end, -end, but it's really the overall outcome that you're trying to achieve. You, you, you may sometimes, you know, be optimizing one piece, but not the whole. So that systems thinking is, is very, very important, isn't it? The systems thinking is extremely important overall, no matter, you know, where you're involved in the process of designing the system. But if you're the data guy, it's incredibly important because not only does that give you an insight into the cycle time reduction, but it also give, it clues you in into what standardization is necessary in the data so that you're able to support an eventual outcome. You know, a lot of people will go down the path of data governance and the creation of data standards, 
And uh, you can easily boil the ocean trying to do that. But if you actually start with an end-to-end -end view of your key processes, and then by extension, the outcomes associated with those processes, as well as the user experience at the end of those processes, and kind of then work backwards as to what are the standards that you need for the data that's going to feed into all that, that's how you arrive at uh, you know, a, a viable, practical data standards effort that you can essentially push forward with. So there, there's, there are multiple aspects uh, when you take that end-to-end -end system view that helps the chief data officer. One of the other tenets of, of data ops is really the ability across the organization for everybody to have visibility. Communications is very key. We've got another graphic that I want to show around the organizational, you know, in, in the right regime. And this is a complicated situation for a lot of people, but it's imperative. Guys, if you bring up the first uh, graphic, it's imperative that organizations, you know, find, bring in the right stakeholders and, and actually identify those individuals that are going to participate so that there's full visibility, everybody understands what their, their roles are, they're not in, in silos. So uh, guys, if you could show us that first graphic, that would be great. But talk about the organization and the right regime there, Interpol. Yes, yes, I, I believe you're going to, uh, what you're going to show up is actually my organization, but I think it's, yes. it's, it's very, very illustrative of what one has to set up to be able to uh, pull off the kind of impact that I talked about. You know, so, Let's say we talked about that central data and AI platform that's driving the entire enterprise and you're infusing AI into key business processes like the supply chain to then create uh, applications like the operational risk insights that we talked about and then extend it over to a fast emerging and changing situation like the COVID-19. You need an organization that obviously reflects uh, the technical aspects of the platform, right? So you have to have a data engineering arm and an AI arm. Uh, you know, in my case, there's a lot of emphasis around deep learning because that's one of those uh, skill set areas that's really quite rare, and but also very very powerful. So, uh, you know, they're, they're the major technology arms of that. There's also the governance arm that I talked about, where you, you have to produce a set of standards and implement them and enforce them so that you're able to make this end-to-end -end impact. And then there's also uh, there's an uh, there's there's an adoption arm where there's a there's a group uh, that reports into me a very very uh, you know uh, empowered group which essentially has to convince the rest of the organization to adopt. But the key to their success has been empowerment in the sense that they're empowered to find like-minded individuals in our key business processes who are also empowered. And if they agree, they just move forward and go ahead and do it because you know we've already provided the central capabilities. By central, I don't mean they're all in one location. In fact, we're completely global and you know it's 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 a hybrid multi-cloud setup, but it's central in the sense that it's one source to come for for trusted data as well as the key expertise that you need from an AI standpoint to be able to move forward and deliver the business outcome. So when these business teams come together with the adoption team, that's where the magic happens. So that's another, um, another aspect of the organization that's critical. And then we've also got uh, a data officer council that I chair. And th that has to do with the people who are the chief data officers of the individual business units that we have. And uh, they're kind of my extended team into the rest of the organization. And we leverage them both from a adoption of the platform standpoint, but also in terms of defining and enforcing standards. It helps us do both. I want to come back to COVID, talk a little bit about business resiliency. People, I think you've probably seen the news that IBM's you know, providing supercomputer uh, resources to the government to fight coronavirus. You've also just announced that, that uh, some, some RTP folks um, are, are helping first responders and nonprofits and, and providing capabilities for no charge, which is awesome. I mean, it's the kind of thing, look, I'm sensitive to companies like IBM. You, know, you don't want to appear to be ambulance chasing in these times. However, IBM and other big tech companies, you're in a position to help and that's what you're doing here. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing in this regard um, and then 
we'll tie it up with uh, just business resiliency and the importance of data. Right, right. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd explained the operational risk insights application that we had, which we were using internally, uh, and pre-COVID-19 even we were using it. We were using it primarily to assess the risk to our supply chain uh, from various events, and then uh, essentially react very, very quickly to those, uh, to those events, so you could manage the situation. Well, we realized that this is something that, uh, you know, several non-government uh, NGOs, that they, they could essentially use uh, the, the same capability, because they have to manage many of these situations like natural disasters and so forth. And so we've given that same capability to the NGOs to you and uh, well, to help them, to help them streamline their planning and their thinking. Uh, by the same token, when you talked about uh, COVID-19, that same capability with the COVID-19 data overlaid on top of that essentially becomes a business continuity planning and resilience. Because let's say I'm a supply chain person, right? Now, I can look at the incidence of COVID-19 and I can, and I know where my suppliers are and I can see the incidence and I can say, oh yes, no, this supplier, I and mean, I can see that the incidence is going up. This is likely to be affected. Let me move ahead and start making plans, backup plans, just in case it reaches a crisis level. Uh, on the other hand, if you're uh, somebody in our revenue planning, uh, you know, on the finance side, uh, and you know where your key clients and customers are located. Again, by having that information overlaid with those sites, you can make your own uh, judgments and you can make your own assessment to do that. So that's how it translates over into a business uh, continuity and resili resilience planning uh, tool. We are internally uh, doing that now to every department. Well, you know, that's something that we are actually providing them this capability because we could build rapidly on what we have already done uh, to be able to do that. And then as we get insight into what each of those departments do with that data, because, you know, once they see that data, once they overlay it to their sites of interest, and this is, you know, anybody and everybody in uh, IBM, because no matter what department they're in, there are going to be sites of interest that are going to be affected and they have an understanding of what those sites of interest mean in the context of the planning that they're doing. And so they'll be able to make judgments. But as we gain a better understanding of that, we will automate those capabilities more and more for each of those specific areas. And now you're talking about a comprehensive approach, an AI approach, to business continuity and resilience planning in the context of a large, complicated organization like IBM, which obviously would be of great interest to our enterprise uh, clients and customers as well. Right. W one of the things that we're researching now is trying to understand, you know, what about this crisis is going to be permanent? You know, uh -huh. some things won't be, but but we think many things will be. There's a lot of learnings. Do you think that organizations will rethink business resiliency in this context, that they might sub-optimize profitability, for example, uh, to be more prepared for crises like this with better business resiliency? And what role would data play in that? So, no, it's a very good question uh, and timely question, Dave. So, uh, I mean, clearly people have understood that with regard to uh, such a pandemic, uh, the first line of beef right, is, uh, is, 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 is not going to be so much on the medicine side because the vaccine is not even uh, available, it won't be available for a period of time. Uh, it has to go into development. So the, the first line of defense is actually to take a quarantine-like approach like we've seen play out across the world here. And then that, in effect, results uh, in uh, an impact on the businesses, right, in the economic climate and on the businesses, there's an impact. So I think people have realized this now. They will obviously factor this in, into, their, in, into how they do business. It will become one of those things from, this is now I'm talking about how this becomes permanent. I think 
it's going to become one of those things that if you're a responsible enterprise, you are going to be planning for and you're going to know how to implement this uh, on the second uh, go around. So obviously you'll put those frameworks and structures in place and there will be a certain cost associated with them. And one could argue that that could eat into the profitability. On the other hand, what I would say is because these are the two points really, that these are fast emerging fluid situations, you have to respond very, very quickly to those. You will end up laying out a foundation pretty much like we did, which enables you to really accelerate your uh, pipeline, right? So the data ops pipelines we talked about, where there's a lot of automation so that you can react very quickly, uh, you know, data ingestion very, very rapidly, that you're able to, you know, do that uh, kind of thing, the metadata generation, just the entire pipeline that we're talking about, that you're able to respond and very quickly bring in new data and then aggregate it at the right levels, infuse it into the workflows and then deliver it to the right people at the right time. Enterprises will, you know, that will become a must. Now, but once you do that, you could argue that there is a cost associated with doing that, but we know that the cycle time reductions on things like that, uh, they can run, you know, I mean, I gave you the example of 95%. Uh, you know, on average, we see like a 70% end-to-end cycle time reduction where we've implemented the approach, and that's been pretty pervasive within IBM across our business process. So that, in, a, in, in essence, then, actually becomes a driver for profitability. So yes, it might, you know, this might back people into doing that, but I would argue that that's probably something that's going to be very good long-term for the enterprises involved, and they'll be able to leverage that in their, uh, in their business. And I think that just the competitive pressure of having to do that will force everybody down that path anyway, but I think it'll be eventually a good thing. That end-to-end -end cycle time compression is, is huge, and I, and I like what you're saying because it's it's not just a reduction in the expected loss during a crisis. There's other residual benefits to the organization. Interpol, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and sharing uh, this really interesting and deep case study. I know there's a lot more information out there, so really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Dave. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. And this is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, and we will see you next time.